that I think that economic populism is actually something that, you know, if you look at it and going back to what we were just talking about with the vaccine mandates, you're seeing a lot of this populist energy find and make strange bedfellows, right? Mm-hmm. Look, at city right now, this past weekend, there was an anti-vaccine march by a group of MAGA supporters in Staten Island, but then there was also an anti-vaccine protest in Brooklyn by Black Lives Matter. Yep, yep. And yet, if you listen to some of the things that they were saying, it was almost the exact same phrases. And yet, here are two groups that are supposed to be, you know, in mortal opposition to one another, and yet they're both agreed it's, that it is, and you know, sort of not a you versus we, but it's an us versus, it's an up-down thing. It's not a left-right thing. <laughs> is China going to become democratic? You look at the history of Tiananmen Square, and certainly, you know, they had a point where it seemed like it might be on the cusp of happening. My theory, though, is that the opposite happened, because the Chinese Communist Party went through the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre. They went through, and this is the key difference between the fall of communism in the Soviet Union and Tiananmen in China. In the Soviet Union, in Moscow, the soldiers refused to fire on the citizens when they were protesting, they refused. In China, the tanks rolled. Mm -hmm. The tanks Mm -hmm. rolled, we've all seen it, right? We don't even need to go go through any more of that. And so this created a situation where the regime was then able to stay in power, but they also realized that they couldn't just keep the people in abject poverty because this created too much of a mishmash. They were gonna have this foreign direct investment that had been started in the 1970s. So what were they to do? So they embark on this new strategy where they have corporate power, from the West, and they have the authoritarian regime of the of the CCP on top. And so what it created was a situ a new type of, of government that really hasn't been seen uh, on on the face of the planet since you know the time of the great you know mercantile empires of the past, where they said, look, there's going to be no democracy, there's going to be pure authoritarianism, but we will allow a market to operate underneath us as long as you don't threaten our political power. This is what the CCP became. So American elites, when they would go over, American politicians or congressional delegations, and I would see them when I was in Shanghai, when they would come over, they would say, wow. Your guy's system is really good. You don't have to worry about any of that free speech stuff. If you want a high speed rail, maglev, you just knock down all the houses. And what about the people? Get rid of them. You know, move them away. Who cares how long they live? You live here a hundred years, a thousand years. Who cares? Your village is in my way. Oh, if you want to build the Three Gorges Dam, well, just flood all those towns. Who cares? Let's build a giant lake. We need this because progress is the only thing that matters to us. And so you take those two forms and put them together, it's intoxicating. It is, it is a form of absolute power, it is intoxicating, and my theory of the case is that in America, our elites, our ruling class, the 1%, whatever you want to call it, and if you actually look at it, the 1% of America, it's uh, you know that, that, that phrase, right? It used to be in the Occupy movement, but the Chinese Communist Party, they're about 1% of the Chinese population as well, it's actually slightly less, um, but I crunched the numbers on it. And so it really is, what you have to do is you have to look away from the elites in society, but if you take, you know, I guess you call them the deplorables or just the American people as a whole, the people that aren't making money, that aren't profiting off this system, and you put them together with, in, in China, the cognate would be the Lao Bai Xing, which means the old hundred names, you know, the sort of like the same burgeoning middle class, lower class in China, they don't have a middle class like we do. Um, you put that together and you say, Hey, these guys are screwing you. These guys are screwing you. They're robbing you blind, right? You know, they're all getting rich. One side gets the wealth, but the wealth doesn't trickle down in China because of their authoritarian system. The one side in the U.S., they're getting the wealth, but all you're all you're becoming is a consumer, right? You get your cheap Chinese TV, you get your cheap cell phone, whatever it is, but you don't get the wealth, right? You don't get any of the benefits. You don't get the jobs. You don't get the secondary tertiary industries that would come off having a primary primary income driver. And this is why the the vast heartland of the United States has been completely hollowed out. You know, I'm from not the heartland, but you know, one of these sort of post industrial cities in the Northeast, and it's it's the exact same situation. Right? This is the reason the Rust Belt exists is because of this. And it's not elite capture. It's not main train candidate. It's nothing like that. It's a merger. That's what I'm trying to get people to understand. It's actually a merger at the highest level. So what do we do? <laughs> so what do we do? Well, Good I mean, luck yeah, with all yeah. of that. 
You have to decouple, right? You have to, you have to decouple and you have to say, you have to come to it from a perspective. And I've been, I've been looking at this thing for 15 years, right? Um, I first went to China in 2006. Uh, I moved there in 2007, lived there for two years, learned the language from the military afterwards. Primary focus was China. Um, it, it, you know, it's, and I'd be in these rooms in the Intel community and we'd be talking about like the South China Sea and we'd be talking about, oh, they're building these islands and they're militarizing the islands and they've got this aircraft carrier and it's going to be coming in. It's going to be doing operations. Well, what do we do? We'll, we'll send a message. Yeah, yeah. We'll send a strongly worded message. We'll, we'll get the United Nations involved, right? We'll, we'll get the three part talks, five part talks. And I, and I would be the, the guy in the back saying, you know, I mean, that's, that's nice, but uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think we're planning to go to war with China. I certainly hope we aren't, but you know, unless you use economic leverage, isn't mm -hmm. why would they listen? It's the only thing they're going to answer to. So it, you, that's what you have to break up. You have to break up that merger. You have to get people to understand that you are being screwed, that you are being robbed blind, and you have to then turn on the economic screws. But I don't care if it's a Republican, a Democrat, or other that does it, right? It's just what's good for the people on both sides of, of the, the world, in this case, on both sides of the Pacific. It's going to be better if you break this up, you start actually having real diplomacy and not these, these quasi-transnational organizations anymore. Right, but is there any chance, I mean, that this administration, or even if we got an American, uh, a Repu American, that was a hell of a Freudian slip, a, a Republican administration, um, is there any chance that America could actually do that? I mean, I certainly don't see it under Biden that, that we could ever, not, no, I guess we could do it, but that we would ever exert the type of influence that you're talking about. I, I think it's there. I think there's I think that economic populism is actually something that, you know, if you look at it and going back to what we were just talking about with the vaccine mandates, you're seeing a lot of this populist energy find and make strange bedfellows, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the city right now, this past weekend, there was an anti-vaccine march by a group of MAGA supporters in Staten Island, but then there was also an anti-vaccine protest in Brooklyn by Black Lives Matter. Yep, yep. And yet, if you listen to some of the things that they were saying, it was almost the exact same phrases. And yet, here are two groups that are supposed to be, you know, in mortal opposition to one another, and yet they're both agreed it's, that it is, and you know, sort of not a you versus we, but it's an us versus, it's an up-down thing. It's not a left-right thing. And so I think the more people start to talk about economic populism, the less that people talk about some of these more caustic politicized issues, uh, I actually think that you there are potentials for a coalition to be built across parties, across nations of people coming together and saying, look, we don't want to be ruled by a transnational you know, elite anymore. We just, we don't want it. We, we want to be countries again. We want to be citizens again. We want to have real diplomacy. Um, you're, France, you know, France is, is, is standing up right now and kind of thumbing their nose at, uh, at, at Biden. They pulled their ambassador, which is like the first time in history that I think that's ever been done. And I think that's, it, in a sense, I think it's good because as the U.S., you know, because the U.S. is losing its its position, right? It's certainly losing its position as the global hegemon, if you will, then uh, it's going to require alliances and it's going to require di actual diplomacy and sitting down with people that we want to have actual help with and mutual aid. You, you, you can't have any more of this, you know, we're going to invade Iraq and you have to come along because we said so, right? Or else we're going to pull this, that and that everything. No, no, we're not going to do that anymore. It, it has to be actual mutually assured benefit. We always talk about mutually assured destruction. Why don't we talk about mutually assured benefit? If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.